be with you. Welcome on this, the second Sunday after the Epiphany. We are now in ordinary time. A couple of prayer announcements. We continue to pray for our country in this time of transition. We ask your prayers for the Hagmeyer family, especially Ruth, as they mourn the sudden death of Bill Hagmeyer. And we continue to pray for all of those who, have, uh, who are continuing to suffer or to recover from COVID-19. Now have a time of prelude and prayer as we turn our hearts to God in worship. We gather for worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us come to God in humility and confidence, confessing our sin before God and each other. God of truth and life, we confess that we have sinned against you. We admit the things that divide us within the church, among the nations, and in our own relationships. We confess we have turned away from your light, pour out your healing light upon us. Through the power and strength of the cross, heal our brokenness, forgive our foolish ways, and make your light shine through us. Amen. The boundless riches of Christ are the gift of God's grace to all people, brokenness. as the called the ordained minister ways. of the Church of Christ and by his authority. I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gathering song is Come Thou Font of Every Blessing.
our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Lord Jesus Christ, most merciful Redeemer, for the countless blessings and benefits you give. May we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day praising you with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from Samuel, the third chapter. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am. And ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Lie down again. So Samuel went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. We read Psalm 139 by verse. Lord, you have searched me out. O Lord, you have known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You trace my journeys and my resting places and are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips, but you, O Lord, know it all together. You encompass me behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. For you yourself knitted, created my inmost parts. 
You knit me together in my mother's womb. I thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. My days were fashioned before they came to be. How deep I find your thoughts, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. Amen. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do, not, do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him shun fornication every sin that a person commits is outside the body but the fornicator sins against the body itself or do you not know that your body is a temple of the holy spirit within you which you have from god and that you are not your own for you were bought with a price therefore glorify god in your body the word of the lord thanks be to god Alleluia, we have found the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who brings grace and truth. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to John, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, very truly I tell you, you will see the heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. From First Samuel. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. And Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy, and he said to Samuel, Go and lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And from 1 Corinthians, All things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful, but I will not be dominated by anything. You were bought with a price. And from the gospel. And Philip said, 
come and see. So it's interesting to take a little shift in this year of Mark from Mark into the Gospel of John, which is longer and very different in style. Uh, Mark is the shortest and sort of the most, the, the quickest moving of the Gospels. John is slightly longer, very different in style, and is considered by most people studying Scripture as the latest of the Gospels inspired by God and given through the Holy Spirit. So some of John's take on things is a little different. He says quite out that there are many, many more accounts of Jesus preaching and teaching, of miracle working, but these are told, that what we hear from John are so that we might have faith and come to believe in Christ, Jesus, as the Christ. So we've taken this shift into the Gospel of John and pairing it with the, the letter to the church at Corinth is our theme where we're going. We're going to be leaning very heavily on the letters to the church at Corinth in these next few weeks between now and the Epiphany. And they have a familiar sound to them. And I've taught both in, in Bible study and in sermons that this world that Jesus occupied when he was incarnate, when he walked in humanity with us, that the world of first century Rome and the Roman Empire was much more like the world that we inhabit now than it was for our grandparents and great-grandparents. Corinth was a, a fairly new city built on an old city that had been conquered. It had been resettled by retired Roman bureaucrats and by retired Roman soldiers and their families. And it was an important commercial center and it had its, its obligatory temples to the pantheon of, of the Greco-Roman gods and goddesses, but it also contained temples to many of the, the systems that were part of the empire because Rome was very good at assimilating and did quite a bit in how it governed people to keep them peaceful without putting them under its boot heel. That They would put them under their boot, boot heel and hard and viciously. But they had developed a system, uh, and some of you will remember that they had a, a system of legal religion. That your, your faith, the faith of a conquered people, would be recognized, given Rome's imprimatur. And they, you could worship in it with, without fear of being persecuted. There were some civil actions that you owed to the Roman gods. But even in that, the, the situation of the area that was predominantly... Jewish was given some special exemptions. So this is the world Jesus embodies and that Paul preaches. It is diverse. It is uh, full of, of travel because of the Roman Empire. It was full of, of diversity of people of, of what we now call races and languages and of religions. And it's into that world that the gospel of Christ has made its appearance. And people are choosing this new religion, this, this new Messiah, and not just people with a Jewish background, but people from all of these other faith systems that were part of the Roman Empire. And it is utterly and totally a new thing. So these people had abandoned what had been familiar sometimes abandoning or, or uh, following Christ and being pushed out of families and other faith systems. And they're coming to find out that they are wrestling together with what it means to be a different body of Christ, different from what mattered in Rome, different from the kind of status that gave you power and presence in Rome. And even as early as that, I, I, you probably heard me say that uh, the seven last words of the church are, we've never done it that way before. And even as early as the churches of Corinth, we see some of that happening. So they've heard Paul preaching about not being bound by the law, and some had taken this to say that they were free to do anything they wanted. The things that they were, past, that they were constrained from in the past, uh, moral laws, laws guiding behavior, and, and 
what we owe to one another, that those shackles were just off of them. So they were acting in ways that were causing division in the community that were, quite frankly, what we would just plain fash, old fashioned now called sinful. And so Paul, this is part of Paul's remonstrating with them and calling them to account and saying, yeah, all things are lawful, but all things aren't beneficial. All things are lawful, but I will not be dominated. Some of them had made a thing, had made it uh, their point of view, kind of how you identified, but saying, but I, but I am free in Jesus, and I'm all about being free in Jesus, so watch me go be free in Jesus. The problem is, their self-proclaimed freedom was not an obedience to the gospel of Christ, and was breaking the law of love, and was causing division within the family of faith. So Paul calls them here to account. And it's, it's really no surprise that the people of Corinth are having this, this struggle with what it means to walk in God's light because the people of God, Israel, had been having this trouble since they were first called to be God's people. And over and over and over again, the prophets came and called them back to God, called them to not following the rules, to keep the rules in a way that kept people uh, marginalized and pushed to the, the edges of society, but that the law was given to bring them closer to God, to call them into a community that supported and cared for one another. And yet over and over the prophet's admonitions fell on deaf ears. And it was the cul culmination of this that God sent his son incarnate to embody our humanity and call us into a new relationship defined by love and by care for the other, by inviting us into relationships that cross the boundaries that humanity has always set up, the divisions that we've created. And yet God still challenges us, and sometimes we're just not listening. And Paul in these, in what we call 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Paul is constantly calling them to a new and radical kind of obedience in community. And it's not surprising that sometimes they seem to have trouble listening as well. Um, I listened to a sermon uh, the other day by Michael Curry, who is the presiding bishop of the Episcopalian uh, Church in the United States. And for those of you who may not uh, call up an image of Bishop Curry, he was the bishop who preached so beautifully at the wedding of the royals, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, otherwise known as Harry and Meghan. And he's a powerful preacher. And I was struck by a story he told about uh, and can, a dealing he had with his then three-year-old daughter Elizabeth. And at that morning, he was in charge of getting Elizabeth out the door and to preschool. And for those of you who can remember or think of it, how much fun it is and how easy it is to get a, a recalcitrant, strong-willed three-year-old out the door when they have strong opinions about whether they or not they should be going or what they should be wearing. And that morning, uh, it was supposed to rain. Bishop Curry had looked up the weather and it wasn't raining then, but they were calling for showers and storms later on in the day about the time he'd be picking Elizabeth up. So he announces to Elizabeth that she needs to wear a raincoat. And she looks out the window and says, no, I don't. It's not raining. And he says, it's gonna rain later. You need to wear your raincoat. It's not raining. It's gonna rain later. You need to wear your raincoat. Uh-uh, it's sunshine. I don't need to wear a raincoat, I don't want it. And so here he is trying, trying to get this three-year-old to wear her raincoat because he knows it's going to rain. And then later on, the, as he's pondering, after he finally gets Elizabeth up and out and to preschool, he is sitting in his car pondering that here he is, he said, I am a grown man, I'm the rector of a church, I have graduate degrees. I know things. I have been around the world. And what's my daughter's response when I say, Elizabeth, you need to wear a raincoat. Does mommy say so? 
And then he said he laughed and realized that maybe the way he was feeling was a little bit of how God felt. When all through the ages, humanity and the people of God, prophet after prophet, we had said, I don't want to. It's not rain, it's sunny out now. I don't want to. What's somebody else say? And that we just like that three-year-old, contrary and wanting to do our own thing, don't always listen to God the way God calls us. And sometimes that's because God calls us to do things in a way and for a cause that we just don't want to listen because we don't want to. Maybe we judge that maybe God's being a little too merciful. Maybe that person's just not enough like me. Maybe that person doesn't agree quite enough with my point of view, upon which you know we humans are always right. And if we're not sure, we can look it up on the internet and get the right answer, always from the internet. But we put our own opinion in the place of God's will and God's word and God's teaching. And now for the, the world of the people of the Church of Corinth in the place of Jesus' teaching. And remember that Jesus teach at this point, they don't yet have the blessing we have in the Gospels that have been given by the Holy Spirit and handed down by the church. They are new and, and the Gospels and the letters of Paul are the teaching. They have access to witnesses who were there and they're still struggling with how to be the church and follow in Jesus' name. And to love those people that they have decided are unlovable, to treat with equity and justice and mercy the people that they think should not have mercy or who are not their equals. But yet are their brothers and sisters in Christ created in the image of God. And even here early on we have Nathaniel saying, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He's ready to just dismiss Jesus and everything he teaches because of where he comes from. And Philip's simple reply is wondrous in its beauty and its witness. Philip simply says, come and see. Because Philip knows that if he comes and listens and sees Jesus, he will see the word made flesh. And that if we go with the church at Corinth and see Jesus in the word, if we listen to his words and not just his words, but how he says them, who he welcomes, who he speaks equity and justice and healing to, we will see the Christ. That will be our light and our witness. And Jesus promised you will see even greater things than these. And if we read the stories of the church, of the early church, in the Gospels, in the book of Acts, in the early church fathers, when the church was, was young and was not legal and suffered great oppression through those writers who kept calling the church to reform and renewal, we will hear and we will see over and over again lives changed, relationships healed, ideas challenged in the face of God's mercy, in the face of God's call to love one another. And so we join with the Corinthians, these brothers and sisters of ours that have gone before, whom in their, their struggle and in their weakness, in their sin, in their joy at coming to know and love Christ, we join with them, the church that has gone before, that great cloud of witnesses. And we join them both to hear Philip saying to us, come and see so that we can say to others who need these words of mercy, who need these words of encouragement from Christ, who need these words to heal, we say to the world at large, we are not perfect, but come see the one who is perfect in love, perfect in healing, and perfect in calling us into a new relationship. We too say, Come and see. Amen.
Our hymn of the day is O Sing a Song of Bethlehem. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Let us join our hearts, praying that the light of Christ will shine with healing on the church, for the world, and upon all those in need. For the body of Christ, gathered throughout the world, and for all servants of the gospel, that the body of Christ throughout the world 
live out our calling every day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. For this congregation, that we see the people and the needs and challenges of our communities today and look to be the church needed in this time and place. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the well-being of creation that God has marvelously made, that we serve as wise stewards of earth, our home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our country, as a new administration takes office and as others continue in service and authority, protect President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris. Bless them with insight, humility, a commitment to the ideals upon which our Constitution is founded, and an open heart for all people under their governance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who long for wholeness and healing, Hear our prayers for all in need of healing care and those who cannot find or access the care they need. Those who are struggling to meet the needs of home and work and family. All weary and stressed by trying to make ends meet and by financial fears. For all who long for peace and justice among nations and neighbors. Give us confidence to bring all our prayers, all our needs, all our fears to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for our neighborhood, for all gathered in body and spirit, and for those absent from our assembly, that all who seek to know God are nourished by the word and promises of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And thanksgiving for the saints who have gone before us, that their lives give us a vision of the gospel in action. In this day, we give thanks especially for Martin Luther King Jr. and his witness to your love and your power to reform hearts and whole societies. May we also seek, Lord, to reach across the boundaries that hum humanity has created and to live out your love for one another in the world and to hear the witness of those who have gone before us and have shown us your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your healing grace, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, our life, and our light. Amen. As we prepare to share the peace of God wherever we are dwelling, whoever we have beside us or in our hearts, uh, we want to thank you for your continued support by your gifts and offerings of our mission and our ministry. May the peace of the Lord be with you also, always. And also so with you.
Let us pray. God of life and light, we bring our tithes and offerings and thanksgiving for what you have given us, our lives, our time, and all that we have. Bless these gifts and make them a blessing to others, that Jesus' mercy and love may shine in our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue with the Gospel of Canticle, the Song of Zechariah. Blessed are you, Lord, the God of Israel. You have come to your people and set them free. You have raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of your servant David. Through your holy prophets you promised of old to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us, to show mercy to our forebears, and to remember your holy covenant. This was the oath you swore to our ancestors Sarah and Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship you without fear, holy and righteous in your sight, all the days of our lives. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Let us join our hearts in the prayer our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I hope you will take the time to look at the announcements that were sent out earlier this week, uh, both by email and by uh, postal service. You can bring to our attention any, any announcements you would like to make. Give the church office a call or an email. Plans for Ash Wednesday and for Lent gatherings are in the works and we'll be notifying you uh, by all of our, our ways on social media and the US mail. Next Sunday is our annual meeting. Uh, the council took uh, action earlier in this in this time in 2020 to make it possible for us to hold our annual meeting remotely by and we are choosing to hold the annual meeting by zoom it will take place immediately following worship next sunday the same zoom link that you receive uh, for worship will also be the zoom link for the annual annual uh, meeting so if you normally uh, attend by Facebook, you should still be able to uh, attend uh, through, uh, through Facebook, since we're going, to uh, we're going to stream that through Zoom, uh, but you will get an email later in the week uh, on how we'll be handling the voting and a link to the annual reports, and that'll be posted to our website as well. And we thank you so much for your support and your patience. Uh, we were never close, but we have shifted how we've done ministry and we continue to serve, to feed the hungry, to support ministries that care for people in this difficult time. And we thank you for continuing to care. And now we continue with the Nunc Dimittis. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace according to your word. For mine eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to reveal you to the nations, and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, and the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. And our closing hymn is Beautiful Savior.
while following worship so we can fellowship and catch up with one another, you are welcome to stay on the link as long as you are able or wish to. Let your light shine, dwell in peace, go forth to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.